David Wheel here from Media Counselors Limited who will be speaking to you about the media and the importance of training and crisis management. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is afternoon, though it's still before lunch. Um, thank you very much indeed for coming along today. Um, what I'd like to talk about now, we talk about the media opportunity or an ordeal crisis management. I want to try and get rid of the crisis management and ordeal side of using the media and focus on the opportunity. The other two are important, but that's what I want to talk to you about over the next half an hour, is how that you can possibly use the media to benefit your organization, big or small. You know, using the media doesn't have to be big organizations. It can be very small local charities. There is a place for everybody. And I just want to take you through some important points that I think you might think valuable and able to take away. Um, first of all, what gives me the right to stand up here and talk to you? Well, I've spent many, many years within the media machine. Uh, you're probably thinking, well, I don't know you. Who are you? I will probably say, looking around the, the room now, the majority of you have heard me. Uh, because for, for many years, I was the voice behind BBC One and BBC Two. And for my living, I used to say, this is BBC One. <laughs> ah, <laughs> now you know. Then, uh, as most things in the media, I was called to BBC World Service, where I was a newsreader there for many years. And then I ventured into television, spent many years there. I was a first reporter on Breakfast Time with Frank and Selina a long time ago, but probably you wouldn't have seen me there because I was on at 6.30 in the morning um, in the days when television didn't really start that early. Anyway, so I've been working around the media for a long time. I've seen the media machine. I've come from that world. And I took about 20 years going through that. Then, like most people, I went into the consultancy world. And I now work for the past 20 years with very large organizations and charities, big and small, advising them on how to use the media in a proactive way to also handle the media if there's a problem, if there's a, a situation. That's called crisis management. Talk about that in a second. But it's really to help them get their message across and to be able to really see how they can use the media as an opportunity. So, you know, I've worked with inside all these particular organizations. I've trained probably about 2,000 executives and I've traveled from South Africa to China, from the United States to Russia and almost every country in Europe. Uh, I was a member of the McDonald's crisis management team for about 15 years, so I've seen an insight from the, the real top there. So what I want to try and talk to you is there is this relationship between the media and any sort of organization. There's a lot we talk about the media machine in PR. Media, some people go, oh my goodness me, it's the media. It's going to be terrible. No, it's not. The media is like a game. And it's a game with rules. If people break the rules of the media, well then, obviously, there's going to be a problem. And there's been lots of people, from Gerald Ratner down, if you remember that awful fiasco, and you look at people who've not handled the media correctly, is they've just broken some very simple golden rules of what the machine is all about. Stick within those rules, and that's when advice and training comes into play. Understand what those rules are, and then it's not that difficult. Also, people worry about going and meeting journalists. Oh my goodness me, what are they going to do? Well, first rule of combat, first rule of competition is know your enemy. You'd never go on a tennis court without knowing who you're going to talk to. Well, you should never talk to a journalist without knowing who you're going to be talking to. So there is a sort of basic common sense come here, into play here. But when you look at the media machine, you look at this beast called the journalist. You know, that's all right. They don't bite. They have parents and they have normal families as well. They are normal people doing normal jobs. They're busy people. The modern journalist today has to file 101 stories. They've got to do social media. They've got to do interviews. They've got to come and talk to you. They've got to write the stuff. So they get grumpy as well. And a lot of people think the media can be quite terse, and quite aggressive. Well, no, it's not because I've got a deadline to make. I need to get this out there. So please help me in that respect. But the job of a journalist is to find a good story. If you talk to any journalist, it's very competitive. They want, as the ultimate goal, is to get their story on page one, to get that elusive scoop. And quite often, they can't find it without your help. So there is a two-way street here. And they've got to fill this great void. 
And every journalist wakes up every day with a simple problem. They've got a blank screen or a blank page to fill. What the hell do I put in it? I don't know what's out there. So there's a huge challenge, and that's where the pressure comes on certain people to get it right, because we need to get that screen filled. Because if we, you know, the six o'clock news will go on air at six o'clock, and if it hasn't got anything, we're going to look a bit silly in that respect. But journalism, never forget, is a business. Newspapers, the sole goal of a newspaper is to make money for the proprietor. Commercial television is to make money. And they do it by selling stories. All journalists have had this situation. We go to morning meetings and we have to sell in a story. What have you got today, boys and girls? Well, I've got this story about this dog's head. Mm, boring, did that last week. What else have you got? Oh, we've got this interesting story about something else. Oh, OK, we'll, we'll try that. And so part of the process is that the journalist has got to be sold in the story. PR companies have to sell in stories to journalists who then sell it into the editor, who then hopefully will sell it to the public and will buy it. So there is a business behind it, but knowing that that's what it's about can help you in that respect. I want to focus on this world, or this world rather, word of opportunity. It's not an ordeal. Oh my God, I've got to go on the BBC. Oh my God, I've got to go and talk to a journalist. No, you haven't. You know, the journalist actually needs you far more than you need the journalist. So it is an opportunity. But you have to think, OK, well, how do I go about that? What is it? Well, first of all, of media is what are you going to tell them? It's not about answering journalist questions. It's about you telling your story. And the story is a very important word. Mankind has been using stories since the Dark Ages to convey information. Once upon a time, there was a nice dogs charity that one day decided to do, oh really, I never knew that. We tell our children stories, but they're all ways of conveying information. It's also about getting people to know who you are. If you want to go and raise funds, maybe have some activity, engage with your local community, how do you do that if we don't know you're there? And the media is a very good channel. That's all it is. It's a delivery channel that is able to reach your audience, your local communities, your national people, your stakeholders in respect. And when I talk about stakeholders, that's everybody who is engaged or has a contact with your business. And it might be your neighbors, it might be local suppliers. They're all interested in your business. And if you've got a good story to tell, they might think, oh, okay, I didn't know that. Let me, let me see what we can do. It's all about building as well your trust bank. If you go out there and are proactive to the media, seek out invitations to talk to journalists. The more that's said about you that's good can actually be a drawdown in times of bad. If I say to you, McDonald's foods, what do you think about them? And most people will say, junk food, wouldn't give it to my kids. No. But if I said to you, who runs the largest children's charity in the world? Any thoughts? So Ronald McDonald houses charities helps tens of thousands of children every year who have to go into hospital and it provides beds and housing for their children, for their parents. Oh, you say, I didn't know that. Okay, well, maybe they are not so bad after all. But if you don't tell us that, we can only assume the word. So it's about your reputation. The media, we know, can be difficult if there's time to trouble, but your reputation is important. It's valuable. Your brand is valuable. Even if you're the tiniest little charity, you'll have a brand. You'll have a badge, a logo, and that has value, and that's important to protect. And also, using the media is a very good way, a very cost-effective way of getting your point across. You can use an advertising agency, your local paper, put an ad in there, cost you a few hundred pounds maybe. Who's going to read that? Why? Well, because you're saying what you want to say. What if your local journalist comes and talks to you and writes a story? Which are we going to believe? which has cost you nothing, and which is going to be more effective. So we call it return on investment in the PR business. But it is a very good way, a very cost-effective way for charities who haven't got much of a budget to engage. So it's about creating a story. What is this word story? Well, it's about what you want to say. It has to be newsworthy. And the word we talk about here is new. You never tell a journalist something they already know. 
well, we run a cat's home, we run a dog's home. Well, I know that. <laughs> what is it about your dog's home that's, that's different in that respect? So stories are very important. We always say about an acid test, so what, who cares? Somebody rescues a cat from a tree. So what, who cares? Happens every day and gets rescued. All right, fair enough. Cat Rescue works in partnership with local fire brigade to provide new ladder that allows cat to climb down off tree safely. Bingo. Absolutely. And get a nice hunky fireman with you know, a photo opportunity with the thing. Bingo. Front page straight away. So it's thinking about what will be interesting. Oh, I don't have a story. Well, yes, look inside your organization, and you probably do. You know, even the smallest operation will probably have a story there somewhere that's worth telling. And stories don't have to be difficult. They don't have to be complicated. Newspapers tell stories very simple. What's the headline? What's the one thing I want to say? Oh, that's interesting. OK, a couple bit more information. information. That'll do. It doesn't have to be a doctoral thesis about what your particular organization is doing. If you can't uh, find a good story, get some advice sometimes. I spend my whole life advising companies, big and small, about what they want to say. It's quite surprising sometimes. A large organization will come to you and say, we don't know what to say about ourselves. But you're a multinational organization. Yeah, but we don't know what we are. Hmm, what do you think you are? <laughs> oh, we do that. OK, why not, why not say that? Well, that's too simple. Well, at least I understand it. So you know, have a look inside yourself. And this is what the journalist wants. It wants good stories. However. You know, the, the media can have a difficult time. You know, what if you have an incident? What if there's an issue? The Americans call it, if it bleeds, it leads. That's why we like bad news as good news. People say, why do the media always concentrate on bad news? Human nature. Two people having a conversation on a street corner, you will walk by. Two people having a fight on a street corner, you will stop, watch, look at what's happening, and talk about it in the pub on the way home. That's why we tend to focus on its pure human natures. But basically, when there is a problem, speed is of the essence. You have to be reactive. And the problem, we call it sort of crisis communications. Crisis management is actually dealing with it, putting the fire out or whatever, looking at the incident. Crisis communications is how you tell the world about it. And there's an old phrase from a very, very well-known PR person called Harold Burson. It says, if you don't get out there and tell your story first, somebody else will, and you won't like the way they tell it. And the media is so quick these days. You know, when I started in short trousers many moons ago, it took three or four days to get a story to air. Journalists would have to physically go out and get things. It took time. Now, with social media, there'll be images on YouTube or Twitter or wherever before you even know about it. And the problem with quite often is that people are caught unprepared. They don't know what to say. And then somebody's rushed in front of the camera and they say something that they regret later. That so many examples of that that happen all the time. It doesn't have to be like that, with a bit of preparation, a bit of thought, thought forethought, um, a, a bit of understanding. It's all about preparation. So think in terms of, OK, I've got a good story, but what if there was a problem? Could I can't cope? You know, what if the not journalist came knocking because they perceived that somehow we are at fault? Could we cope? You know, what would we want to say? You know, a lot of large organizations will have a holding statement, which basically says something but says nothing. Well, we don't know what's happened at the moment. We're looking into it, um, and we'll get back to you. Terrific. That's fine, as long as we've got something. What we don't want is that wall of silence. And worst of all, we asked them for a, for a, a comment, and we didn't get one. No comment means guilty as hell. No comment because I don't quite know what's going on yet. We need to get inside the barn and have a look. Fair enough. So. Crisis management doesn't have to be a crisis. It can actually be handled again and turned around and again as an opportunity to see that you're doing things. We talk about this thing called the media interviews. People come up to me and say, I've got to do an interview tomorrow, I'm scared. And I ask them, why? Why are you scared? And they say, well, well what if the journalist asks me a question that I don't know the answer to? Well, you say, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Why would a journalist want to ask a question that I don't know anything about? And people say, you know, but they're out to trick you, aren't they? No, unless you're a multinational organization that's ripping off your customers or your politician. Different story. We could give you a hard time, but you're not in that realm. Newsnight and, you know, the day program are not going to come knocking on your door. If they do, you have a real problem and you need to get some serious advice. But 
if you actually want to analyse what a media interview is and what a journalist wants, we ask you to come on and talk about something you know about. How hard is that? If you don't know about it, why would I want to talk to you? It's not a test or an exam. We want somebody to come on and tell us a good story and give their side of the, of the, of the, of the situation, what's happening. It's not a question and answer session. If you think media interviews are question and answer sessions, you will fail because that's following the journalist's agenda. So tell them something interesting. And obviously, yes, there's the technical paraphernalia, having microphones up your nose and, and whatever, but you know, that's, that's dealt with. First and foremost, we will actually like you if we good, do a good interview. And at this stage, I want to bring somebody on who actually is at the sharp end, who you probably, many of you know, who actually has to do this day to day. Carolyn. David, thank you. Um, any of you who are in the hall next door um, probably know me more as being a trainer and behaviourist than standing up here and talking about media. Uh, but what some people will know, I've been writing in the media in dog press and in national press since 1999. And I've also been working as a presenter for radio and for television for a lot longer than that, as I did a postgraduate diploma in multimedia production. So. I do an awful lot of this both across print media and also in radio and television. The majority of what I'm doing at the moment is I work for Talk Radio Europe doing an interview-based programme that I do live from events. And the one that I did from Crofts this year, which is what that picture's from, had one and a half million listeners. Um, so that's kind of pretty much what I'm doing an awful lot of. So what I wanted to do was just talk for five minutes as to what I'm looking for. As David was saying, it's an opportunity and shouldn't be an ordeal, but it really helps if you know who your opponent is. Um, and if you come on Talk Radio Europe, at Crofts, at Discover Dogs, your opponent's me. Um, so I kind of wanted to tell you what it is that I'm looking for. No matter how much I love the companion animal world, when I'm working as a presenter, I have one thing to do. That's what I am employed to do, and that is to be entertaining. That is the number one thing that I have got to do. So the first thing when I'm compiling who I want on my shows, I need to find someone who's entertaining. I need to find someone who's got a story to tell me, and that I think they're going to really tell that story well. That's the first thing I'm looking for. And if people don't tell me that story and let me know about it, then I don't know it's there. So the first thing is I'm looking for people I think can come on and be entertaining. The minute that program starts, I am on such a time sensitive, everything is timed pretty much to the second. So once you're on there, I can't get rid of you if you're boring. I'm going to have to just keep going with this. If you're entertaining, if you can talk, if you can tell me that story, the story that David's been talking about, then quite frankly, I'm going to let you do it because you make me look good. Um, I can plan my next person that I'm talking to. I can you know, look at Twitter. I can see what people are saying about the radio program. Um, I can kind of just leave you to it. Uh, I might interrupt you. If I do interrupt you, partly it's that people still know that I'm there and haven't gone for a coffee or a wee or something like that. But the other, my other job is I have to be the ears and the voice of the people who are listening. So if you've said anything that's not clear, then I might get you to clarify that. If I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying all the time, and if you say something that I think the people listening to this are going to be thinking, oh, I wonder what, then I ask that question. But pretty much, if you can tell that story, if you're really good at telling your story, I am going to leave you to get on with it. Uh, because that makes my life easy, and it's fulfilling my number one criteria, which is my program has to be entertaining. That's why I'm employed. The problem happens is if you're not entertaining, um, because I can't get rid of you. This is time to the minute. I'm going to have to battle on with this interview. So I've got two choices. One, I'm going to decide, quite frankly, I'm only human. I'm going to decide whether I like you or not. I'm going to decide whether I like you whether I like your organisation and whether I like your message. And if I do, I will bail you out all I can. 
I will ask questions to help you. I will do everything I can to get your message across. Problem is, that is going to break up your flow. And then I might actually start asking questions that you don't know the answer to. And then you don't look as good because you're not prepared. You don't know how to tell your story in the best possible way. If I don't like you, well, then all bets are off, quite frankly, because I can be equally entertaining by being combative, combative, can't even say the word, but I can do it, um, and making you look kind of fairly stupid. Uh, I don't want to do that. Um, I want everybody who, I'm a really nice journalist. I do really, really nice radio shows. I want everyone who comes on to be able to tell their story. Um, if you can do it, it's all yours. I'll let you do it. But if you can't do it, I still have to be entertaining. That's why so many people do interviews and say it was awful. It was awful because you weren't prepared. You didn't know your story, and you didn't know how you were going to tell it. So you left the interviewer with only one choice. I've got to make this entertaining somehow. Um, I'm very, very nice. If you ever come up against Jeremy Paxman, Jeremy Vine. Jeremy Vine has kind of got the really, really bad rep for anyone who goes on doing animal-related things because he, he's not a great... I don't think he's a great animal lover because he does spend a lot of time making people feel stupid. But I've listened to an awful lot of spokespeople on his program from big organizations who didn't know how to tell their story and they pretty much walked into it. He's as lazy as all the rest of us. If you can tell your story well, he will let you do it. So that's my side of it. That's the interviewer's side of it. Basically, you tell your story and you tell your story well and we're going to let you get on and do it because it's what's going to make us look good. So I'll pass you back to David. Thank you, Carolyn. So we've seen there, basically, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a double act. Yeah, we want you to come on, but it's got to be, sorry, it's got to be a combination of the message and the messenger. Yeah, you can have a great message, but not a good messenger, and it won't get through. And unfortunately, the history is littered with people who've had good messages, but the spokesperson or woman just doesn't get it. They don't look right. They don't sound right. Unfortunately, the medium is a uh, medium of impression. We take a snap judgment as soon as we look at you. Do we like them? Do we trust them? Do we listen to what you say? No. We remember nothing. But we will take away an impression. Oh, they were good. Did you hear that interview with so-and-so? Yeah, they were good. What were they talking about? No idea, but they were good. We do it all the time. It's human nature. So in order to be a good messenger, you've got to have simple language. You've got to go back to basics. It's a golden rule at the BBC that you broadcast to an intelligent 12-year-old. What do you mean by that? Well, you never hear the word oxymoron on a Sky News bulletin. Why? Because the audience don't understand it. Simplicity is the important point. If you can come across and tell quite complicated things. I have to train scientists from Imperial College and other, other universities. And they will come up with the most amazing things. The one I was doing quantum physics. And they're trying to explain that they discovered that Einstein's rule can be broken. I'm thinking, OK, how do I get this across? And we thought, and, and well, basically, we can move light around things. Really? OK, fine. Well, how do we tell that story? Because no one understands what quantum physics, physics is. So we came up with a very simple story. And the headline in the Times the next day was scientists invent Harry Potter cloak. Well, it wasn't the Harry Potter cloak, but we sort of get the idea. <laughs> if you want the detail, read the paper. So getting the double act is very important. And it's creating that win-win situation. If, as Carolyn said, if you can come on and do a good turn, as we say, you know what? We'll have you back. If you're rubbish, we won't have you back. There's lots of other people who are clamoring to get on our programs or to be quoted in our newspapers because it's good PR. And therefore, if you can come on, that's why we see the same old people, isn't it? Whenever there's a plane crash, whenever there's something else, there's the same person that's wheeled out to say the same thing. Why? Because we're lazy. Why make 10 phone calls when I know I've got a local person in my community who is an expert on that particular issue? Well, who am I going to call? Well, you, obviously. Why? Because you're on my program last week, or I phoned you up last week for a quote, and you were helpful. And so we do get this collaboration that's going on. The, the media is collaboration. It's not confrontation. Unless you're a politician, which is a different story altogether. And people say, but, you know, 
we all beat up, you know, journalists beat up politicians. Yeah, you want to know why? Well, simply because they're playing, the journalists are playing a very simple parlour game that barristers play. A lot of journalists have legal background. And it's based on a simple, simple premise. I know you're lying. You know you're lying. I'm going to get you to tell the truth. And you're going to avoid telling the truth. And that's why we have, Minister, did you threaten to sack <laughs> for the 15th time? Because I know you did, but you don't want to say it. That's a different kettle game, a kettle of fish, different parlour game altogether. You're there to, as I say, use that five minutes as a great opportunity. And obviously, preparation and training is important. Uh, why? Well, practice makes perfect. You know, if you fail to prepare, you'll prepare to fail. And people think, well, that's very expensive, isn't it? Well, no, it's not, actually. What is it, an interview? It's you sitting down with one of your colleagues and saying, all right, I've got to talk to this journalist. Interview me about it. Ask me some questions about it. But actually, I don't care what you're going to ask me because what I'm going to do is tell you how to get your story across. And Caroline just mentioned that, you know, if I do start asking you questions that you don't know the answer to, what do you do? Well, it's a very simple technique called bridging. That you say, well, actually, I don't know about that. But what I do know is this. Now, it's a little bit rude because we don't do it at home. You wouldn't have a good relationship for much longer with your wife. Well, darling, what are we going to watch on television tonight? We are going to be doing this. It may work for you, but it doesn't normally. But in the media, it does. Well, what do you think about this? Well, that's not the issue we're talking about today. What I want to concentrate on is, and you'll hear it all the time now, so it is a way, even if you are finding it difficult, to come back. But you've got to have that lifeboat, which is your story at the end of the day. You know, people say, but, you know, it's expensive. No, it's not. You know, it all depends, you know, what you want to, to get out of it, really. Small charities, their organizations, you know, I counsel big and small. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be in the realms of, of big PR. But practice is absolutely important. And I'll give you an example uh, of a corporate. I worked for McDonald's for, for many years, and the CEO had to go on Newsnight to protect his company's reputation against a very, very severe critic. And uh, I worked with him. How long do you think I took? He had to go on Newsnight to do a 10-minute interview against the, the, that organization's greatest opponent. How long do you think I prepped him for? One hour? Half a day? A day? Three days we took <laughs> to get him right, to go on there. And he went on there, and he did a very good job because he prepared. He knew all the arguments. That's an extreme case. But he then had the confidence, saying, fine, ask me, because I've prepared about it. I've thought about it. So training is vital. So in conclusion, PR is simple. What do you want to say, and who do you want to say it to? That's what I was told. It's not rocket science. But you have to look at your own organization. And I really stress, and how many times did Carolyn use the S word? And how many times have I used the S word? Story. Yeah. Go back. You know, scratch your head and thinking, well, do we have an opportunity? Who is your local media? They're out there. They don't bite. You know, go back to your villages. There will be a local paper. Regional newspapers are very, very powerful. And you know what? People say, but newspapers always report bad news. Yes, the nationals do. But if you look at your local newspaper, the majority of stories are actually good news stories. And where do they get them from? Well, people tell them. <laughs> Journalists say, well, I don't know. They don't have a magic finger and say, oh, let's do dogs and cats homes today. Why? Because we haven't done them for a while. No, no. There'll have something that will happen. There'll be an issue. And if you're happy to go out and, and seek them out, then you become a very valuable source of information to that journalist. So when there's an issue, we come back to you, and therefore you go on the radio, the television, or in the newspaper, and underneath is your name and your organization's name. And the perception is, you must know what you're talking about because you're on the telly. <laughs> If you weren't any good, they wouldn't have you on. So that's why organizations use the media. Uh -huh, it's that strap line that gives you the credibility. And obviously, advice, training is important because you need help. Some people don't like going on the media. They feel it is you know, not comfortable. Well, of course it's not, but you know, it will help you get over that. So in conclusion, I will say one thing. And it's a quote from the Dalai Lama, and it says, when you talk, you're simply repeating what you already know. When you listen, you might learn something. Thank you for listening, and I hope you've learned something. <laughs>